Welcome everybody. Thanks so much for coming to this presentation. Hopefully we'll, we don't have too much of the post-lunch slump um, and this will be interesting information for everyone. Um, so the presentation today is called Exploring the Intersection of Physical and Mental Health, which seems kind of like a, a bit like a scientific topic, but I promise it's a bit more practical and school-based um, outside of that. So my name is Mary Lauren Salvatore and I'm the Assistant Director of the Office of Hold Child Supports at Georgia Department of Education. And it is really nice to be with everybody today. I was um, lucky to be a part of the initial planning conversations that happened for this conference with Dr. Schoenfeld and um, Mr. Rubio. And so it's really awesome to kind of see this day come to fruition. And hopefully everybody's had uh, as fruitful as a morning so far um, as I have. It's been a really, really great conference. So we're going to go ahead and jump in. And I, before we get started, would kind of like to know who's in the room. So I, I know in my previous one, and I think probably general population of this conference is a lot of support staff. So counselors, social workers, majority of you, school, okay, two school nurses in good company there. Anybody who falls outside of that? You're the pastor? Okay, awesome. Okay, great. So I'm a MTSS coordinator at my school. Oh, wonderful. Okay. We are just learning more about the MTSS world on our team, kind of undergoing a well, MTSS has been part of our office for about a year now, but undergoing kind of a merge between PBIS and MTSS and our team. So learning a lot more about that, which is great. Awesome. Well, glad to have everybody here. So objectives for our presentation today, I called this tuning in. If anybody here likes to practice yoga, I love the beginning of a yoga class. You're kind of working on that tuning in piece and getting situated for the, the next hour. So I'm going to give a little bit of context about how we got here and kind of why we're talking about this today. I'm going to dive into some data that supports the work that we're doing, which I warned the last group uh, might be a little bit like depressing in the beginning. It's kind of a, a lot of data that you'll look at and say, oh, this is, you know, a lot. But I promise the whole presentation is not like that. And we're going to spend the bulk of our time talking about the health barriers to learning and development, which has really laid the foundation for a lot of the work that our office has done at the DOE. And then I'm going to leave with exploring tools and resources. So just a couple of key resources I'm going to show you how to use at the end. And during each of these sections, I'll take a little break and we'll have some pause time to reflect and ask questions. So if you have something you want to ask, there will be time throughout. So you won't have to wait till the end to save anything for that. So how did we get here? Let me give a little bit of timeline about how we started talking about health related supports at the DOE and where we are at now. So I came to work at the Department of Education in 2019 in an office that did not last for too, too long, unfortunately, but we were supporting the state's lowest performing schools. So bottom 5% of the CSI, TSI, and Promise schools. And they were mostly located down in the Southwest region of the state. So I spent a lot of time down there. And my role was created to look at non-academic insights. And so we kind of figured that for coming from um, a public health background in nutrition, which is what I am, it made kind of sense to start with health because I knew a little bit about that and there was going to be some resources around it. So we started there. And once we had that established, I had to work on developing a lot of connections, both inside the Department of Education and in local communities and in the other state agencies surrounding that supported student health and kind of had a mission of health and well-being to understand what resources were out there. And then I also had to do some research because I'm not a Georgia native. And when I first started my job at DOE, I was quickly asked, well, have you ever been to Southwest Georgia before? And I said, no, but I went to college in West Virginia. So I imagine it probably couldn't be too different. <laughs> I like I like a peaceful drive on a country road, uh, but I still had to learn a lot and, and did learn a lot about what that area of the state is like, which was a true wake up call, which we'll get into a little bit. Um, so I had to do all of that, and then I quickly had to figure out, what am I going to do here? So this was a new position in a new office, and they were kind of relying on me to figure out, you know, we're going to come in and look at non-academic supports, and you've got to build your partnerships quickly and then take off and run with it. So um, that's what I did, and it was a really, really rewarding experience, and I like to think that I was able to kind of follow this model here, which is the Godot system of continuous improvement. So I started by identifying the need, like I said, did some, some data diving on what was going on in those communities from a health perspective, selected interventions. So I was scrambling around quickly, trying to get to know people at the Department of Education and ask them what types of interventions they had for different things, just being the newbie. And I worked with schools and other partners and 
uh, partners within those communities we were working with to kind of plan what that implementation of, in this case, school health screenings was going to look like. We implemented them and we did some examination of progress at the end. And, you know, the goal of this is always that that was kind of the start of it, or I hoped that that would be the start of taking a deeper dive into investigating non-academic barriers in these schools and figuring out kind of what could be done on a more coordinated approach to address these things along with academics. So in the Office of Whole Child Supports, and you will see these couple of things which are in gray, so they might be light for y'all in the back, but the five key tenets of whole child education are healthy, safe, engaged, challenged, and supported. And as we go through this work and we go through this, these slides, I want you to kind of maintain a focus on those five words. And when we're thinking about whole child as it's kind of become a, a little bit buzzy and trendy of a word that that's really at the heart of what we're talking about when we say those two things. So as I mentioned, my background's in public health. And when I got to the DOE in 2019, I realized really quickly that I did not speak education. <laughs> and I was sitting in a lot of rooms with people having meetings and conversations, just kind of trying to figure out where do I fit in here? I know that healthy students make better learners. And I understand kind of from the research that I've done, you know, what seems like it might need to happen that could be of help or what we're going to try to do in these schools. But I had a really hard time figuring out, well, how do I add value to this conversation? How am I going to get a school principal to think that this is worthwhile? Um, and so I was trying to think about things that might resonate that I could bring to the table. And some of you might be familiar with the social determinants of health but it's really a foundational principle in public health education. And I thought this might be relevant and resonate a little bit because what I'm talking about is the conditions that we live in, where we learn, where we work, and where we play, and how those conditions themselves, just the place, can affect our quality of life risks and outcomes. So particularly in these communities that I was working with, we had lack of healthcare access, we had lack of access to school nurses and other school health professionals in the schools. Um, we had poor housing conditions in the community. So just simply that situational thing. So I thought that might resonate a little bit with these principles. And then I thought, I know a little bit about tiered supports. I don't know about RTI or MTSS yet, but I do know that those are something that we're, they talk about a lot. And I know about tiered supports in terms of prevention. So in public health prevention, there are three, three tiers of support, starting with primary, which I like to think about as community-wide education campaign, just general health education. So it's that awareness and health promotion piece before you get to a point of trying to identify disease or a health condition that falls under secondary prevention. So as we get older, there are different you know, milestones that we hit in age where you have to start getting screenings for things like mammography or colon cancer screenings and things like that. Um, we know that if you are predisposed to something, you have family history, you might start getting those screenings on a regular basis. Um, in our state, we only have screenings required at entrance to school for students through Form 3300. While there are many school districts that do have regular screening protocols, it's not something that's required um, at the state level. So that's a, a critical part of what we're going to be talking about today is kind of the secondary phase of prevention. And then tertiary prevention, which we see a lot of, is the intervention piece and management of conditions. So this is when you get to You've screened, you've found out that the child has asthma, and then you are working with the child and the family, getting them to the doctor, they're getting on medication, getting educated on how to manage, and then you're doing your best to support that student through that, that journey to make sure they have what they need in school. So I thought I can speak in this tiered language a little bit. And surely by now, 2019, everybody had seen this, I hoped. So this is the whole school, whole community, whole child model, which is a product of the CDC. And the goal of this model was really to look at education from this more holistic health-related standpoint. So the text is really small up here, so I'll read some of these for you. But when we look at the whole child model, we're not talking just about math and reading and writing and, and science. We're talking about what types of services are in the school. So are there health services? Are there counseling and psychological services? What's the nutrition environment like? What is the school environment like? Is it a safe space? Is it a supportive space and a happy space for kids? How involved are parents in the community? Is that something that wraps around the school or is that a struggle for reasons of there aren't community resources or the, the community is disconnected from the school for some, some other purpose? Are students getting physical education, and physical activity like they should be? Are they getting health education like they should be? 
what does the physical environment of the school provide for them? And throughout all of this, is there a team at the top kind of coordinating these policies, the processes and practice of whole child education? So again, I thought maybe the CDC has brought this and it might carry some weight and we can talk about this integration of kind of health services into schools and what this looks like. But it didn't all start to click too much until I came across this really great article from the Children's Health Fund. And it's actually more of an, less of an article and more of a, a really great literature review. But it's called Health Barriers to Learning, the Prevalence and Educational Consequences in Disadvantaged Children. And this, art, this summary is all about a handful of key health conditions that affect children disproportionately in low-income, underserved communities. And it was an eye-opening read and has really laid the foundation for a lot of the work that we've done. And if anybody in here is a reader and likes a good article, I would highly, highly recommend. But this is a quote that stuck out from it, is that there are many reasons for less than optimal academic performance, especially for children who live with persistent adversities or chronic stress. However, too often among these reasons are health conditions that have been unrecognized or undermanaged. So a little bit of data to kind of back this up. As I said, I am not a Georgia native, so I learned quickly a lot about the different landscapes of the state. And this was one of the first things I dove into because I also realized quickly that identifying good quality health data for children age 0 to 18 is tough to come by. And so asthma was something that there was good data on. So I was able to start here. And this is a map of the state broken up into our public health regions. And the coloring of the map is reflecting asthma prevalence in these communities. So you can see here that this part of the state, the darker red, and then up here in metro Atlanta is much higher. So the prevalence in that orangey color is 9 to 11 percent, and then in the dark red, 11 to 14. So this is highlighted because this is kind of the area of schools that I was working with down here. But I've also included, and I'm going to share these slides with Eric afterwards so they can be shared out, but there's some really great quick data resources on these slides that I want everybody to have access to. So there is the first one that I have listed here is county health rankings and roadmaps. And I love that site because you can go in, you can type in your county, and it will populate a whole bunch of data for you that's very easy to digest, very relevant things you might want to look at, like what is the, uh, the poverty percentage, what is the food insecurity percentage, what is the um, distance to healthcare, all different kinds of things. But like I said, very easy. And the best thing about it is that it takes all of the counties in a state, even all 159 in Georgia, and ranks them based on their health outcomes. So in the counties that I was working with, we were ranging from 126 to 150 out of 159. And for child food insecurity rates, we were looking at 27 to 36%. So high numbers there, over a third of kids experiencing food insecurity. And then really high asthma prevalence. So about nine to 14% in these communities. <laughs> And then I was able to go a little bit a step further. I, my coworker Kim sitting in the, the audience, but when I first started to get to know her I, and was working at the DOE, I didn't understand that we had such a lack of school nurses across the state. So I remember learning that first and feeling like this is a really hard thing. Like there are lots of schools out here that don't have school nurses. What do you mean? And then I learned that there were lots of counties in our state that actually don't have pediatricians either. So this is a map from... Um, recently is 2020 that demonstrates there's 65 counties in the state that don't have pediatricians. So, yeah, it doesn't, so it doesn't mean there, are, if you go to this website, the Georgia counties, this is the link, Georgia counties without primary care practitioners, but it's the Georgia Physicians Healthcare Workforce Report. So you can see um, counties that don't have OBGYNs or family care practitioners. Um, I think there might be dentist on there. There's a handful of different ones. But yes, so lots of areas in the state that lack this critical healthcare access for kids. And this data comes from the Annie E. Casey Foundation. This is just a snapshot at child well-being overall in our state. So out of 50 states, Georgia ranks 38th in child well-being. And these are just a couple of highlights in the economic <laughs> section. Almost 20% of kids living in poverty, about one in four parents lacking secure employment, which I found to be really high. 
education. We, I think, are all aware of our, you know, reading proficiency issues in our state. And when it comes to health, uh, you can always find statistics about overweight and obesity, if nothing else. Um, but staggering, you know, over a third of kids in our state are overweight and obese. And then when it comes to family and community, we have about 9% of children overall living in what's considered high poverty areas. Annie E. Casey Foundation is also a really, really good resource for looking at some health and academic data. It's more in a list format, but you can access it all on one site. And then I wanted to provide some reference points here. They don't trip over my cord. Um, so we're going to dive into a little bit more about each of the five conditions listed on the left, but I wanted to provide these points of reference. So our state average for asthma prevalence is about 7.5%. Our state average for food insecurity is 14%, and I believe that number is from 2020, like pre-COVID 2020. Um, Georgia was doing really well on food insecurity efforts before the pandemic hit, which is unfortunate. I'm not quite sure where we're at now, but that's the most recent one I could find. For uncorrected hearing problems, the, the prevalence data there isn't for hearing problems that are uncorrected. That would be a tough thing to find data on. But in nationally, about one to six out of every 1,000 babies born are born with some degree of hearing loss. So that's kind of a good reference point, but it's much rarer for a child to have um, hearing loss than some of these other things. Oral health risk or untreated caries, so kids having a cav cavity that's gone unnoticed, about one in four, and that's for age six to nine. And then for uncorrected vision problems, vision problems are super common, right? I think I have on another slide, it's about one in four. But in terms of like persistently kids with uncorrected vision problems, only about 6% is the expected national average. And then to do some justice as we're talking about both physical health and mental health, I'm gonna share some data from our 21-22 Georgia Student Health Survey. And the, the Student Health Survey, I believe, is still not mandatory. Um, and it was not in 21-22, had been in previous years, but done some moving around because of COVID. Um, and does everybody know that you can access all your Georgia Student Health Survey results? Okay, I see lots of head shaking. Sometimes you say that and people don't know where it is, but it's there. So we're, I just pulled out a handful of questions that I felt like were relevant to this conversation. So 54% of students that completed the survey reported feeling depressed, sad, or withdrawn in the last 30 days. About 16% experienced severely out of control behavior. 30% experienced drastic changes in their behavior and, and or personality. About 41% experiencing intense anxiety, worries, or fears that interrupted daily activities. About 30% experiencing severe mood swings. About 55% reporting feeling always stressed. And commonly when you look at this specific question on the survey and then you look at reports of what the top, top causes of stress were, they tend to be related to schoolwork. And then this one, always important to show, because I think this just resonates through the rest of the presentation as we're talking about connection, but less than half of students strongly agree that there was an adult at school they could talk to if they needed help. Okay, so I just shared a bunch of data. Before we move on, does anybody have any questions about this or reflections or experiences they wanna share? Part of this year, I work in a very, very rural school district, and the response rate for that survey was not high. I, mm. I wouldn't even consider the results valid because of how few students actually responded. Yeah. It was a terrific tool, but it is hard to use as meaningful data because of the response rate. Same thing with the parent survey. Yeah. That just the, you know, you go through data walks through your district and well, what do we do with this? Because I forget how many responses typical are in anyway. Mm -hmm. so, that's so you're just talking fun. like in the last couple of years? Yeah. yeah. And you know, that's that's kind of been a pain point too. And, you know, we adjusted the survey when COVID started because most of the questions are about experiences in school. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't feel right to be asking experiences in school while most kids were learning at home. And so we've been kind of undergoing this lots of discussion over the last year or two about what to do about the survey, how to get it back to 
a point that can be really useful for us and useful for schools as well. So that's a good point just to, you know, as, as there's been some inconsistency in it, that it's not always quite as helpful. Anybody else? Okay. So as I mentioned, that health barriers to learning report really has been um, a grounding piece of evidence for this work. And so I wanted to take some time to really dive into each of these. Hopefully some of this will be new information for you guys. So as I mentioned, whole child, that's you know the name of our office. It's really become a more talked about term, a more buzzy term over the last couple of years, which is great. I love that we're having conversations about education and health together. And when I think about it, you know, we started out really thinking about education as the ABCs and the one, two, threes. And there are lots of different things we can use to describe whole child. And I, I think I found this just by Googling well-being or something like that for kids. But I love this graphic because there are lots of different words you could throw into whole child. That framework is huge. There's lots in it. But I think that when you think about well-being, and that's what I associate with whole child, and we're you know talking about a healthy kid ready to learn, these are kind of the key components. So has this child had the opportunity to exercise and be active? Are they being fed well and adequately? Do they have a positive outlook on life, generally speaking? Do they feel purpose in the places that they're at in their own skin? Um, are they getting enough sleep at night? Are they coming to school with, you know, well-rested? And are they healthy? So those are all big things, but I think it's a, this is an easier way to kind of look at a snapshot of, you know, what we mean when we say whole child. Is anybody familiar with attribution? We're going to give a little, a little dictionary lesson here. So attribution is the action of regarding something as being caused by a person or thing. And as I was thinking about it, I kind of realized that it's sort of like the apple doesn't fall far from the tree kind of scenario, right? Where you might have a certain way about you, a personality trait that you got from one of your parents and it pops up and you're like, man, mom, like I wish that you hadn't, you know, given me this particular trait. So thinking you're attributing your behavior to something because of a parent. And then going a step further, attribution theory is, again, that it's that under, attempt to understand the behavior of others by attributing that causation to how we personally feel, belief, um, intent, personality, and situations. And then how we might react to those behaviors are more determined by our assignment of the cause, so what we think caused the behavior, than by the behavior itself. So for example, we'll take this little girl who has decided to show up to her math class every day and put her head down on the books and fall asleep. And her teachers have decided that they're going to do a behavior analysis because this has been going on for a while and we need to do something about it. So they're labeling her behaviors and maybe they're saying that she's withdrawn and has poor social skills in this class that she's sleeping in. And then in her other classes, her teachers are describing her as aggressive or reactive. So when they're labeling these behaviors, they might come up with persistently disruptive or willfully disobedient. And then as we're walking down this path of talking about mental health and how we might label behaviors or jump to a conclusion that a child is having a mental health issue, we might say that this child is depressed or she's experiencing anxiety or maybe ADHD. So we're going to come back to this graphic later on in the presentation. So what if we're just labeling these behaviors based on our own perceptions of mental health alone? This child is sleeping a lot. She seems to not be very present. Maybe her mental health is not in a great state right now. So where do we start by looking beyond that, just labeling that behavior based on what our assumption of what it might be is? So the health barriers to learning were initially, as we came across the concept defined as these persistent and prevalent health conditions that when they were left unrecognized could affect a child's ability to learn. But as I've continued doing this work for the last few years and really understood it in practice a bit more, it wasn't just that that child was losing their motivation to learn, but it was also inhibiting their development. Because if you have a child that has can't see for a year or they've got... Um, a hearing issue that hasn't been addressed, 
that's going to that's really going to affect their physical development and might affect their emotional and cognitive development as well. So we expanded the, the term a little bit to be health barriers to learning and development or HBLDs. And I'm going to share a quick video. If I can find the play button. Well, Teachers know their students, but sometimes identifying an issue can be difficult if they can only see what's on the surface. So when a student misbehaves or ignores them or bombs tests when they know the answers, the reason for doing so could be very different than what they might think. It's hard to concentrate on anything when it feels like someone is jackhammering on the clock. They might have the answer to a math problem or know exactly how to spell a word. But if everything is looking blurry or they're seeing double, it can be very frustrating. Sometimes a cough isn't just a cough, and sometimes breathing heavily isn't because a student is nervous in class. If a student is ignoring you when you're speaking directly to them, or they're just nodding their head constantly, maybe they're just having a hard time actually hearing you. Food insecurity is a reality among students in Georgia, and it's hard to do anything when you haven't had enough to eat. To help you dig deeper and know what to look for, we've created a Health Barriers to Learning and Development Toolkit with lots of resources that includes a list of extraordinary professionals like doctors and dentists and administrators and teachers like yourself who are committed to helping your students with whatever medical hurdle they may be facing. Visit gadoe.org slash whole child today. Okay, so we're going to get to the toolkit, but I just wanted to share that video to get us started. Teachers know this. Oh, now it works. <laughs> okay, so when we think about what might influence these barriers, it could be all kinds of things, right? But here is kind of a snapshot of, I think, highlighted things. So talking about poverty, we're seeing a lot of these higher prevalence rates of things in our more impoverished communities, poor housing situations, access to health care and access to quality health care, insurance status. You know, over the last couple of years with fluctuations in parents' jobs and uh, Medicaid policies that were enrolled, started in COVID are going to be changing soon. That could have fluctuated a lot. Stress, we've all, I think, been under a lot of stress the last couple of years for a variety of reasons. That translates down into kids as well. That could also inhibit, if that's going on in family dynamics, that there's a lot of stress, that could inhibit getting the child to their appointments and getting them to the doctor at all, or maybe just the, that care and supportive environment. Safety in the community, safety in schools. So lots of different things could influence these barriers, but just a, a, a handful of things to, to notice that are highlights. Now, going back to that social determinants of health comparison, I think this is always a great example about lead exposure. So children that are living in homes built before the 80s when there was still lead-based paint are more likely to be exposed to um, higher blood blood levels. And so we know that there is no safe level of lead in the blood. Any any level of blood, any level of lead in the blood can attribute to a child's you know this, uh, mental and physical ability to grow and thrive simply just because of the house that they live in. And it's not something that we can see from the outside. We can't see the child squinting if they have lead exposure in the blood. It's just you know relying on having that be tested. So it's it's something that can really silently be in the background but have a, a profound effect. So we're going to dive into a little bit more of the data. So specifically about asthma, children that, that have asthma miss almost 14 million days of school annually. That's national numbers. So asthma is a huge contributor to chronic absenteeism, especially when it's under controlled. And students with asthma are also more likely to visit the emergency department and be hospitalized. As I showed with the large number of counties in our state that don't have access to pediatricians. There's even less access to as asthma and allergy specialists. And in a lot of those communities too, no um, hospitals. So those people, uh, those students are more likely to be visiting the emergency department when they have an issue as opposed to visiting a primary care provider. And to look at asthma alongside some educational data, this map shows the rate of emergency room visits for asthma for children age zero to 19. 
So you'll see darker shading over here. You'll see darker shading down here. It's dark in Atlanta too, but covered because there are lots of schools. A little bit of dark down here as well. So when you look at all these dots overlaying, the dots are elementary schools and the color of the dot reflects third grade ELA proficiency. So not in all cases by any means, but it's just an interesting way to give a little bit more perspective. You see up here, there are a couple of dark purples with red dots, a little bit down here, a little bit over here, and there's a lot again in Metro Atlanta. So it's the Get Georgia Reading Campaign is a really great tool if you're a data person to get on and kind of look at a state level perspective of academic and non-academic data alongside each other. So moving on to oral health, children with poor oral health or chronic dental pain are more likely to report feeling unhappy, worthless, or overly sensitive. I think everybody in the room, I'm sure, can relate to an unpleasant dental experience where you were just uncomfortable. Imagine having like throbbing dental pain going on in your mouth for weeks and how it might be to sit in a classroom and try to learn when you have that going on because you can't get to the dentist or you can't get to a dentist in general. And when you have that happening as well, you tend to have trouble sleeping and eating. Children are more likely to miss school. And if they are in school, they're probably going to have a tough time paying attention, right? They have other things on their mind. As I mentioned before, about one in four students will have a vision impairment of some kind. It can be fixed with glasses. But think about how you react when you can't see. So see lots of people with glasses in the room. I'm wearing contacts. If I was sitting here and the board was over there and I didn't have my contacts in, I wouldn't be able to read anything on that screen. So if we think about the number of kids who might be sitting in the classroom and their glasses broke and they can't get a new pair through Medicaid for six more months, or they don't know that they can't see the board and not everybody sees the same way as them, that's a big problem, right? And about 80% of learning occurs through visual tasks like reading and writing. And if you have uncorrected vision problems for long periods of time, that can ultimately lead to blindness or more severe vision issues. So again, this is another example of if something persistently goes unaddressed, it can really, really affect development. Even minimal hearing loss places children at over four times the risk of difficulties with language and communication. And then these children, if they're having that ability, the dis, um, this <coughs> inability to communicate properly, excuse me, then they're at higher risk for challenges with social, emotional, and behavioral problems as well. We were talking about this earlier that you know, vision or hearing loss is so much less common than vision losses or vision problems. But today we're seeing, you know, in this age of everybody having headphones on at all times, this kind of issue with persistent noise exposure could really actually have effect on hearing loss for kids, um, or any age for that matter. So they're, you know. We think of uh, hearing issues a lot of times, I think, as being diagnosed at birth through newborn screening, which is super common, but we also have issues with loss of follow-up with that and hearing loss that can develop as childhood goes on. What we might not know about food insecurity is it can often be mischaracterized as defiant behavior or depression and anxiety. And, you know, we think we've all seen the term hangry before, but it can really be a real thing, especially if you, you, know, you don't know where your next meal is coming from, or maybe you got to school, you missed breakfast, you're waiting till lunch, you didn't have dinner the night before. So lots of different things. But you know, when, you, when you think about labeling behaviors as these things and not knowing that it might be because the kid is hungry, it makes you think about it a little bit differently. Stress is also something that often presents as physical symptoms. So in children, you might have a kid complaining of an upset stomach or a headache or a lack of appetite. So I think as we're looking at this, I want to revisit some data from the beginning now that we've seen kind of seen the impact of some of this um, physical health issues maybe presenting like a mental health symptom or um, a mental health symptom presenting as a physical symptom. So as I mentioned, when I was doing the work in Southwest Georgia with those schools, we were able to do some health screenings and then on the other end of the health screening supported these students in schools in getting what they needed. So providing glasses, providing oral health clinics, and a lot of the work around food insecurity was just trying to make connections, trying to improve access to school meals, things like that. In the case of asthma, so remember that state average was 7.6%. It was 28% in these communities in total, and then about 17% at 
at, were at risk of an asthma diagnosis. So this was a survey that went home to parents that they filled out and was based on symptoms. Food insecurity was 36%, so significantly higher than the state average, but what was expected for those communities of what we had seen on paper. Uncorrected hearing problems, this is really high. Um, and what's important to note about the hearing problems is that hearing screening is not quite as cut and dry as vision screening is, where a child fails a vision screening and then they go have an eye exam and they're able to get prescription for glasses. Hearing screening involves a handful of different steps. So this was just after an initial screening, this was the percentage of kids that needed follow-up. Also really interestingly, and we've seen this happen a handful of different times, when we were having hearing screenings done, we had a huge earwax issue. So that when the screeners were going in to actually put the probe in the child's ear, they couldn't get the probe in there because there was so much buildup. So that's something that happens as well. Um, with oral health risk, this is really, really high. So this was um, also based on a survey and then in some instances actually having a, a hygienist or a nurse do a dental, a, a brief dental exam that was alarmingly high for oral health. And then for uncorrected vision problems, about 21 to 23%, which was what we were anticipating in these communities with, without having access to regular screening or good access to healthcare. So very high compared to a national average. But ultimately, there were a handful of takeaways here. We had results that were three, or three to four times higher than the points of reference. And we're able to recognize that, yes, Southwest Georgia is a unique area of the state. But if you looked at those maps, there's lots of similar characteristics in lots of other areas. So I didn't imagine that what we saw there was something that was just happening in that area of the state. But what we mostly saw was that there's a lot of students that are missing critical opportunities to learn because of preventable health issues. Um, not that having asthma is preventable in most instances or being born with hearing loss, but things that, can, that have solutions, right, that can be fixed. So going back to that initial graphic we were labeling behaviors, what if that little girl that was sleeping was hungry or had a cavity or had hearing loss? And what about that child that's missing school all the time? Maybe they have asthma and they had to make multiple trips to the emergency department. If they had defiant behavior, what if they were just hungry? If they were sleeping in class, maybe it was because they had dental pain. If they were showing symptoms of anxiety, maybe they are experiencing hearing loss. And if they are refusing to do their work, maybe it's just because they couldn't see the board. But you could also look at all of these things and think, that all looks like disrupted mental health to me, right? So it's all about perspective. And I think as, as I talk about this and you introduce this concept of all these different effects that these physical health barriers can have, it's important to remember that we're not talking about every time a child has, you know, they're missing school chronically or they're sleeping in class, that it's one of these things. It very well might not be, but there's enough data behind it that it makes it worth it to kind of use as a rule out, if nothing else, right? So Dr. Schoenfeld was talking this morning about, you know, you put a lot of students down a path of mental health referral and trying to get them services and diagnosed with mental illness, and you end up missing a lot of kids along the way because maybe there was something at a tier one level that could have been done to kind of address what they were dealing with. So I won't dive too deep into this mental health versus mental illness piece because I am by no means a mental health expert, but I always like to think that this is an important distinction to make as we do have this conversation, that we all have mental health and our mental health comes out in our emotions, in our thoughts and feelings, in the way we interact with others, our ability to problem solve and ability to overcome day-to-day -day difficulties. Mental illness is on a deeper level, right? That affects in intrinsically the way that we think, we feel, and behave. And there are many different types of men mental illnesses with many different symptoms and many, many different impacts. But things that we do and things that surround us can both have a positive effect or negative effect on both our physical and mental health. So if you think about healthy lifestyle habits, getting enough exercise, eating right, getting enough sleep, that has just as much of a positive benefit on our physical health as it does our mental health. Anybody ever like taken a really good walk or had a great workout and then mentally felt great afterwards? <laughs> Something as simple as that, right? Um, physical wellness or the absence of disease, the supportive family, modeling of healthy behaviors. Like Dr. Schoenfeld talked about that again this morning with that professional self-care piece is that the more that we can 
exhibit and practice these behaviors on a regular basis ourselves. The kids are watching. Um, and then in the case of mental illness, a lot of times medication, psychotherapy, those are things that can help. They're improving your, your mental health and then giving you the ability to improve your physical health as well. And then negative contributors, things like our brain chemistry that we cannot control most of the time, family history and stress, unhealthy lifestyle, illness, substance abuse, unsafe environments, safety, trauma, things like that. And just as we would think about our own physical health on a, a, a trajectory of some kind or a continuum, our mental health is like that too. And this really resonates with me back to the whole piece of connection and needing to understand where children are at on a baseline so you're able to recognize when they're in crisis or struggling or when they're doing really well. Because if we don't have that foundation, then it's going to be really hard to tell when they're kind of moving back from one thing to the other. So in kind of wrapping up this little section, I was like just remembering that our health is on a continuum, our physical health, our mental health, they interact, they work together. Um, and they complement each other well. And just, again, here, it, it's kind of about connecting these dots. Hopefully some dots are starting to connect for some of you if this is new information or a reminder of information that you've heard before. But I really love the opportunity to have these conversations, to, to talk with educators, to talk with health professionals, and figure out how these things can be interacted or interactive and work together and we can have these productive conversations about getting students in school healthy and ready to learn. <coughs> okay, before we dive into the tools and resources that I have to share, any questions after this section? Questions, comments? No, okay. So I'm gonna share a couple of things. So as I mentioned in the beginning, I can speak this language all day about tiered prevention supports. So I think in schools, and I see our role as state support in, in our office to provide tools for primary prevention. What can be done for all students in a classroom setting, in a school setting, in a school district setting that's going to help a wide range of, of students? There's always going to be a need for your secondary and tertiary prevention, but that's going to come through first doing these things and then identifying at other levels what types of support students might need. So this is the Health Barriers to Learning and Development Toolkit. And this was created as a way for schools and community partners to be able to respond if we knew that our county had a high prevalence of asthma and we wanted to do a screening and then some more deep dive in our school district to find out, are we keeping track of this? Is this something that's affecting kids' attendance? Um, and it's meant to be used very much in an ad hoc way or a la carte way, if you will. You don't have to go in and address all of these things at one time. I wanted this to be a good tool for somebody who might be applying for a grant or writing a school improvement plan or a, a clip where you have to always have data to support why you need funding for something. So in this um, toolkit, there are quick pieces of data for each of those health barriers to learning. So you can pull those right out of there. There are references at the end. This is on page. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this is just screen grabs of each of it, but it's actually a very cool little like Adobe digital oh. toolkit that moves. But there's a PDF version of it too if you want to print it out. Um, this is really the heart of the toolkit. So this first column over here is the screening and observational tools. So these were things that were well vetted by the right people, health professionals, um, and we've got links to all of them. Other than vision and hearing screening tools themselves, all of the screening tools that we've suggested in here are free of charge, can be accessed by anybody. We provide some suggestions. If you wanted to purchase um, a vision screener, like a spot, they are several thousand dollars and expensive, but if that was something that the district wanted to invest in or the RESA, you could consider some cost sharing and sharing of the equipment widely. Uh, but everything else is easy to access. That was a huge goal of this, is we wanted to put this together as something that anybody could use and it wouldn't be cost prohibitive. The second column is an example, um, examples of each of these for follow-up actions. So you do a screening, what next? What happens if the kid fails? So for asthma, we have up here, ensure students with asthma have asthma action plans things your school can be doing, like following the Asthma Friendly Schools Toolkit, um, and then the indoor air, indoor air Quality Tools for Schools Action Kit. And then we've listed in this third column, partner organizations and resources. So 
Some of these are statewide organizations. Some of these are suggestions of who to reach out to in your own community. Some of them might be uh, a local public health office or a family connection collaborative or extension, something that's in every community in the state. And then this last section is about how to apply this across disciplines. So we all know that lots of schools and districts have 6,000 committees for different things and different meetings and frameworks. And the intention of this is by no means to create something new to have these conversations, but to integrate this into conversations you're already having. So if you're on an attendance committee or at a school support team meeting or something like that, weaving this into the conversation when you're talking about, we have this huge percentage of kids that are missing school, why are they missing school? Kind of taking that step further and looking at things from a slightly different perspective. And the same thing for community partners. We want this to be a tool that they could use as A, to bring awareness and B, as to find a way to help, to find a way to be a partner to a school, maybe because they have resources or manpower or capacity to help that the school might not be aware of. And then I'm gonna share a really exciting new data dashboard that we have, and it lives on um, our Georgia Insights page. And this is a dashboard that is meant to bring together both health and academic data. So some of it is some of the data that I shared as we went through the first part of this presentation. And others of it are just things that I thought, not just myself, a lot of people put work into developing this dashboard, but other things that we thought were going to be helpful when you're thinking about whole child data. So you can start, and I'm going to show you all how to actually pull up the dashboard in a minute and navigate through it, but you can select your district. Over here is a list of all these this data. And what we decided to do, instead of listing like a percentage or a statistic in that column, was make it a ranking so that somebody that wasn't familiar with looking at health data could look at this and see how they stack up to another county. Where do I fall among the entire state on this particular thing? This center part just shows a snapshot of that. If anybody's familiar with Fitnessgram, this is one health data point that the state does require collection of on an annual basis. So we've included aerobic capacity and body composition there. The bottom is Georgia milestones data because again, I at one point was putting together all of this data and gathering it from lots of different websites and putting it together for superintendents. And I thought the, the purpose of this primarily is the health data, but I want them to kind of look at it in coordination with their um, academic data as well. So this isn't ranked because we can't rank milestone, we can't rank schools based on their milestones data. So this just is percentages, but still a good way to, to have a reference point. This up here in the top right hand corner is a map that shows distance to a federally qualified health center and you can adjust the mileage. So I'll show you how to do that too. And then down here at the bottom, if this is just somebody trying to do some research and they weren't familiar with a particular county, they could see, okay, this is Appling County. They have about 3,500 students and it's a remote town. So we know that it's rural. Um, let me switch over my screen. Okay, so this is the live dashboard. We have a brief overview section that just kind of goes over what the purpose of this was, why the data is relevant for educators what the rankings mean, why we decided to go that route, and what kind of questions it could help answer, and then some terms and definitions, because there are definitely some very non-educator, non-education related terms on this dashboard. We have a discussion guide that I'm hopeful is a tool that people can use to integrate this conversation into conversations they're already having. So as you're doing, I think you mentioned back there, like a data walk, this, that guide would be a way to what questions do you need to ask as you're having this conversation and looking at this data? And then some brief instructions. And then this tab has a list of the data sources that you can access. So I want to show you how this works. So with this healthcare map here, you can go as little as 10 miles or as far as 100 miles away. So I'm going to put Walton County in here and see what we find. So Walton County's got lots of schools and then one federally qualified health center up here, all within 10 miles. So estimated travel distance to care, 7.6%. You're considered rural, 15,000 students. 
and then some good rankings up here, 33rd for health outcomes and health factors. So yes, I would encourage, this is a, hopefully will be a useful tool, um, not only for pooling data for things, but for explore, exploration purposes and, and conversation starters. So this again is also linked through the PowerPoint. Okay, and then just a few final notes in closing. As we're talking about, you know, different things that we can do in the previous session, somebody sitting up in the front was telling me that she's a social worker and she feels like she's constantly just spinning her wheel. So what else can I do to get parents to take their kids to the doctor or to help them maintain their asthma or their diabetes? And while I'm I'm never going to have the perfect answer to that, I encourage people in the room to share. I think we can focus on things that we can do, which are things like perfect protective factors. So ensuring that kids are able to have that trusted relationship with an adult, creating this environment of connection and support inside schools and in our communities, being able to provide and connect parents to adequate and concrete supports, cross-system collaboration. So whether that be internally in a school with different services that are supporting students or between the school and the Department of Public Health or the DFACS office or the Community Health Office, just having that consistent um, communication that makes things simpler for parents. And on a personal level, that healthy expression and communication of emotions and ability to self-regulate. And the single most common factor for children who develop resilience, one of our key words today, is at least one stable and committed relationship with support of parent, caregiver, or other adult. So if nothing else, we can always do this. And just to close on this, re-showing the whole school, whole community, whole child model, I think really that community piece is huge and being able to come together, again, whether that be in our, our smaller groups in schools, um, with our peers, with students, with parents, just having that connection piece with the community um, is really where it, where it all gets started. So that is my final slide and I've got my contact information up here. Um, lots of good stuff on our website, on our Twitter account. Um, feel free to reach out at any point, but I'll be happy to take any questions that anybody has.